So, on the, on the screen you'll see a couple of abbreviations. These are common terms used with John Deere and others in the industry to, you'll find them helpful in, in regards to understanding the presentation today. The, NOx is nitrous oxides, PM is particulate matter or soot, uh, <coughs> parts per million, not really anything different there. The, the new thing that, that everybody is interested in talking about is the, the depth here. Obviously, John Deere is, is using depth on final through four. So, this whole presentation is to explain how how we got to this point and how John Deere's engines that come out of the Waterloo are any different than the others in the industry. So let's proceed. Again, thank you in advance for your kind attention. And let's uh, let's get right into it. So in 2000, we started with the Tier 1 emissions regulations of the 8010 series. And as you can see, we just improved on, on that common 9 liter engine block for the high pressure common rail or wastegate turbocharger on there met the tier two stage two emissions. 2006 tier three again added that variable geometry turbo, the exhaust gas for circulation and a very cool fan. Again 8R series uh, really no major significant changes to the, uh, <coughs> the overall structure. Excuse me. Can you guys hear all right back there? Do I need a mic? We got a mic. I do have a little bit of a cold going on, so I'll try and speak up the best I can. In the 2011 IT4, I got a larger EGR, the diesel oxidation catalyst, and the diesel particulate filter. And, and so what uh, we're going to talk about in this presentation is really where we started, where we, where we got with IT4, and then how Final Tier 4 uh, really just improved on this building block foundation. None of these things really came off of the, the tractor as it went along. They just added to and kind of improved and accentuated those engines and their performance. So again, welcome. My name is Luke Larson. I'm a, a field marker here in Avoca. My previous uh, employer was John Deere Waterloo Works. I spent six years in the factory up there. I did not work specifically on engines, but I did work with all the products that came out of Waterloo in one form or another. So, a little bit about me. Final Tier 4 and the New Frontier. So, how is it going to affect it? Let's talk about what, what the government has done as far as off-road emissions regulations and, and what has it affected. It's really affected everything from players, trains, automobiles. But really we're talking about off-road stuff. So coal mining equipment, tractors, rail locomotives, all of that has to meet the same final tier four emissions regulations. So one of the things the EGR is really good at doing is, is uh, reducing the amount of NOx. So it's up here at the, at the top, but one thing that it's not so good at doing is, is particulate matter. So that would be soot or ash, whatever you want to call it, black stuff. What's really good at reducing NOx is the SCR. And one thing that helps improve on both of those is that higher fuel injection on the common pressure rail system. And then when we add in a combination of all of these, you get down in this neighborhood. Well, that's really good for IT4. And that's where we had gotten using just one single fluid source, diesel. No death at IT4 on the fuel engine because of the EGR this high fuel injection pressure, the, the variable geometry turbo, and then the filters to help reduce that particulate matter that was created by the EGR. But we really weren't doing much to cut that knock stuff. And so what we were able to do is add just a little bit of, of the SCR, of the depth, in that system and, and get our emissions down here to the final tier four of requirements. So we're talking about a lot of hot air here for 3% of the total exhaust is 0.3% is what's regulated by the EPA, by the government. So essentially 99.7 of your hot air coming out your exhaust stack is complete combustion. It's nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide. There's nothing to regulate it. That's fine. Well, 
what the government's concerned about is this part right here. This nitrous oxide, this carbon dioxide, and this particular matter. That's what they're really after. So it's a lot of equipment to have to put on there for that incomplete combustion that essentially is, is making up 0.3%. All right, if you can bear with me. I know it's kind of a long day, but I got a, got a short video I think you'll find amusing. I hope anyway. <laughs> I don't want to be too boring. I know I've been told I'm a little technical. This may be hard to see. <coughs> and it's certainly hard to hear without a microphone. But essentially what we've got here, I'll try and describe it the best I can. This is a plowing competition in Germany. And I don't know if they do this every year during Oktoberfest or what exactly, but uh, well, I, well, it was a tractor pull contest. No, they got a they got a six or eight pound plow. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. yeah. So I know this is how you guys used to farm, <laughs> or maybe you thought your neighbors farmed this way. One or the other. I think they've been here. So you have it in the ground. Oh yeah, it, it was it was in there. So let's get back to our slide. So here's what here's what we're really talking about. So we're reducing reducing emissions at every level. And and I don't want to I don't want to read this whole slide to you guys. The gals will want to read, but if you can see it. The, the NOx is on the bottom and the particulate matter is on the top. And right over here, this is IT4. It's a small down here, and then this is final kit 4. So there really wasn't any reduction in particulate matter going from IT4 to final kit 4. What there was was an 80% reduction in nitrous oxide. Now we talked about that EGR was really good at reducing particulate, or at Excuse me, the EGR was really good at reducing nitrous oxides to a point. However, it created particulate matter, so that's why we put that filter on. But it could bring us all the way down. So there's just a little bit of nitrous oxides left, and that EGR wasn't able to completely finish that combustion in the chamber. So what did we do? We added the depth to to just finish that up. And what that means to you is there's less nitrous oxides to treat with the DEF. That means less DEF consumed. The other guys don't have the UGR. They don't have the, the variable geometry turbo. They don't have the decent particulate filters. So they're just treating all of the nitrous oxides. And they're taking care of their particulate matter by calibrating their engine differently, maybe hanging an exhaust valve over so it's it's burning it up, but it maybe isn't running that optimum engine performance. So that's kind of a, a little secret there. Again, not to not to waste your time, but a little trivia for you. When did John Deere come out with the first diesel engine? And what was the tractor, if you know? You just shout out, anybody. 435. 59. What was it? 435 or 50. It was a Model R in 1949. Very, very close. And for that, uh, here is a hat. You have one of these? Nope. All right. Thank you for participating. <laughs> All right. So, how much difference is there in the EEF consumption between deer and deer? You're about six slides ahead of me. <laughs> That's a good question, though. And thank you. I'm not going to dismiss diminish that, so there's a hat just for speaking up. <clears throat> we will get to that. Um, but before we do, I want to talk about how Deer kind of made this transition. So at Tier 2, again, we were recapping, they added the high pressure fuel rail and four valves per cylinder. That was a 50% reduction in NOx, 50% uh, in PM and 20 NOx. Tier 3 added the EGR and the VGT, the variable geometry turbo. IT4 added the dock filter and the DPF. <clears throat> that was a 90% reduction in PM and a 50% reduction in NOx. All right. 
So there's again another kind of visual indicator that building lot approach. Explaining and, and giving some uh, visual indicators of what we have going on. One thing that's important to note is the air and air cooler. That uh, I is when I started in Waterloo, I didn't really understand the impact that air and air cooler has on the intake system, but it is it is important after that in coming air runs through two turbos, it's getting pretty warm, and that air to air cooler helps bring that combustion temperature down in the chamber and improves the amount of diesel to air mixture and that combustion. Um, let's, next slide. So there's the four valves, the two, two, high pressure common rail. Uh, let's, here's another question. When did John Deere first use electronic engine controls? What year was that? Anybody know? You got a guess? It's okay if you don't know. Oh, just in 2000. 2000. 1988. 1988. They first used electronic engine controls. That's a different hat, I think, than what you've got. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Quick question for you. Yeah. The fuel pressure, the fuel pressure, right. What is the injector pressure at? I do not have that. I, I'll be honest with you, I did not uh, get the actual fuel pressure on the numbers. They did. That is, that is correct. And uh, I, I can't tell you what it's at. Right now, but I can find out for it. Yeah. Low sulfur? Yeah. Yeah, you gotta use the ultra low sulfur diesel for sure. Oh, you're you gotta use that fuel additive to make sure that that doesn't come up the injector because the ultra low sulfur is such a high pressure. Here's that term, high pressure common rail. That's a picture there, obviously there. What specifically uh, are your specs on that? Or what is that all one together? I mean, I, I really don't know. What, what could be the internal? What does that look like? Well, in this corner of it right here is a fuel pump, and that, yes. yeah. and and so then that's just that's just injecting your diesel into that that tube, if you will, that, that fuel distributor, and then each injector has the same distance. Uh, In, into the piston itself. So right. The to the work. combustion chamber, I should say. Right. Yeah. 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 So, I hope that I helped to answer those questions. All right, so next we added the EGR, exhaust gas recirculation and, and really what's going on here this is this is my my favorite part and the, the kind of key thing tier three this really helped improve the the overall engine performance and, and I know it sounds odd to run that burn exhaust back through the intake but by mixing it and by running it through the end, they were really able to help reduce the, the emissions coming out and, and you can run those engines at peak performance of torque and, and horsepower. And, and it's really uh, something that I, I think the regionals are we're very proud of that, that system. It's, uh, it's very, very robust, and they have a lot of hours proven on that, on that particular part. So again, here, Tier 3, 
Um, just kind of showing that EGR is reducing the NOx. The, the downside is it creates a little bit of PM and, and the advanced fuel injection system at a little higher pressure is, is helping to uh, reduce that. Again, just another picture of the engine and how we to discuss there. IT4 added the dock and the DPF to catch that particulate matter. And let's see. Yeah. Slides got mixed up on it a little bit. So, yeah, I don't know if there's any questions on this, but the, the dock and the DPF are, are working with the diesel fuel. There's, there's a diesel inject, uh, doser up there on the front of that dock that helps to enhance that chemical reaction that goes on in there. There's not a fire. It's not an internal combustion in that filter. It's just to improve that chemical reaction between the nitrous oxides and that diesel fuel. And it only does that when your engine uh, exhaust temps are low and, and not able to do a natural kind of self-cleaning through that system. So if you're running it at 1800 RPMs and your exhaust temp is higher, you're working that tractor, it's going to naturally clean that out and there won't be any diesel dosing going on in there. Again, kind of an, another slideshow. Uh, just showing the airflow and the series turbochargers. Oh. <clears throat> the first John Deere tractor that had a turbocharger was. Anybody know? Chris, you know? First tractor with a turbocharger? A year? A John Deere. 4430's close, it was a 4520, it was 1969. Did I give you a hat already? <laughs> you didn't get a hat? Okay. Alright, yeah, I think you There you go. Thank you. Yep. <clears throat> Alright, next slides. So we've got that. Um, final tier four. So this is really what you guys are after today. Uh, DEF tank is on there. Here's the uh, DEF supply module and a filter. There's heated lines for the DEF. Obviously, it's 66% water and 33% uh, urea. So that's going in. And then you've got intracoolant lines as well to keep that DEF injected warm and cold over the weather months. The, the mixer is a, could be a straight tube or an elbow, this pipe here. And then it's going right into the SCR, and that's where that first initial chemical reaction is taking place. And the AOC is right behind it. That's the ammonia oxidation catalyst. That's kind of a more long-term NOx treatment uh, area. And the whole thing is, is lined with temp sensors and NOx sensors. And that whole emissions uh, system is computer-controlled based on the input that those sensors are, uh, are giving. And you can see that at Tier 2 and Tier 3 IT4, none of that equipment really came off. That, that solid core engine block and the aftermarket exhaust, not aftermarket, but the after-treatment exhaust equipment stayed on, stay in place. So there's all, there's all that information right there. All right, how many original equipment manufacturers worldwide use John Deere engines? Any idea? We haven't heard much in the back here. You guys uh, want to throw a number out there? Throw a three-digit number, pretty big size number. I'll give you some clues. It's less than a thousand. Five? No, 700. Sorry, you threw me off the 250. 700 original equipment manufacturers use John Deere engines. So that's, uh, that's worldwide. There we are with IT4, and then here's the uh, final tier 4 components again, kind of a review. There's the diesel dosing injector in front of the dock, uh, and, and 
that dock will last the last life of the machine. I believe they say that the DPF is rated for 5,000 hours. And then we've got the, uh, the DEF dosing injector. And that's the selective catalytic reduction. So similar to the catalytic converter in your car, just minus the depth. Uh, as far as I know, and, and don't quote me on this, but I have not seen anything that says uh, a particular hour or life cycle. So now, that's not to say that that isn't necessarily uh, a replaceable component at some point, but in the literature that I have read and found and, and talked to, I've not, I've not gotten anything that says it needs to be replaced at a certain time. Uh, again, another picture showing those series turbo chargers. How much you re-up per tank of diesel? Let's just, let's just get through this slide and we're going to get right to your question, man. So here's the NOx coming in and the uh, NH3 coming in with that urea and that chemical reaction with a certain amount of heat. And on the outside you get oxygen, water, and nitrogen. There's the filter, the dot, the EPF, the outlet. Here's the decomposition tube. So this is just kind of where you got exhaust air is mixing with the depth through it. Again, kind of a review of this. Uh, I don't know why that slides in your place. There's the SCR. It's kind of got a honeycomb batter to it that just holds that uh, urea on there long enough for the NOx to go through it and, and be treated. And then in that AOC, the ammonia oxidation catalyst is a bigger area, a, a larger surface area for more longer term treatment of the nitrous oxide. The DEF tank is a high density polypropylene plastic. It's got room for expansion. Adjacent freezes. Uh, there is a, a heating coil on this element and with the engine cooler. Uh, when you start the tractor, if you're feeding cattle and it's January and your DEF tank is frozen solid, your tractor's going to run just like normal. There's not going to be any codes or faults or anything. So once that engine cooler starts to heat up this uh, pickup screen and, and melts enough of that, urea in there and it'll start to suck it through the lines. When you get done in January and you shut that tractor off, that <coughs> little pump uh, motor, well, let's see what goes back. I mean, I didn't know. This little deal here, this dosing unit, will reverse the flow of death on the lines and take it back to the tank so there's no urea or no death frozen in the lines. You don't have to worry about that either. So. And then once it once it goes out, you just do this on the tractor. So this should answer a couple of questions we got earlier on in the presentation. So an IT4 John Deere will say it was 100% uh, diesel, and, and others in the industry were as well. However, at IT4, Deere was a single fluid source. We did not use DEF, while others in the industry were. But admittedly, they were only about three percent of the total amount of diesel running through the machine. With Vital Tier 4, we were able to improve the engine efficiency and they were able to recalibrate the engines to run even more optimally. And we saw a 4% efficiency improvement on the diesel usage on the deer engines. And admittedly, we added the depth which was ranging between 1 and 3 percent usage based on if it's a 6.8 or a 9 liter or a 13.5, the larger using the larger percentage of depth. Unfortunately, the others in our industry, or fortunately for us, uh, they didn't really have any significant diesel efficiency improvements because they didn't have that building block foundation that we started with back in 1995 with the high pressure common rail and the EGR. So they're, they're really not seeing a significant gain on diesel, and they have more NOx to treat because they have a greater distance to bring that down to meet those final 4 emissions. 
So from a total fluid efficiency standpoint, you're going to wind up uh, running through a lot more depth on the, uh, the off-brand equipment. Now, I didn't set up the demonstration today, but we, we just left Columbus, Ohio a couple weeks ago, and they had a side-by-side -side comparison of the red combine and green one. And they said they ran these through some field tests, and the gentleman said, two jugs of urea up there on the table and he said this is what you would need for your green combine for however many acres, I think it was 500. He said, and we ran this red combine behind us through the same test, same field conditions and approximately the same setup, the uh, row head size and everything, and he set up there, I think it was 12, if I'm not mistaken, it was a substantial amount more of urea. So. That slide is, is pretty impactful when you start to run the hours through the machine and the, the tanks and diesel through the equipment. That's really going to impact you. If it's a John Deere, 100 gallon of fuel, how many ounces or right here? So, so if it's so if it's a if it's a 9 liter engine and you run 25 hours on it on the machine, <laughs> and the, the corresponding diesel to go with that would be about 2% of that diesel would be the diesel exhaust fuel. So that would be roughly a two and a half gallon jug. And how, much, how big is the reservoir on the How big is the tank? Well, it's going to vary for each for each machine, but I think on like the $8, it's six gallon maybe. So, and the competition is like they, they have some of the 30. 30. And the competition is going on to you guys because of the excess heat John Deere is putting into the engine versus the heat they're putting into this. Right. And their longevity, they say, will beat the Deere engine. Okay, so on the heat side, the Deere engine block has been improved on. The core crank, the crank shaft is 17 pounds heavier was in previous models. The engine block has improved cooling for antifreeze. There's cooling for the piston sleeves. There is uh, additional improvements and added weight in the block itself. So, yeah, we have additional heat in the combustion chamber. I, I'm not going to dispute that. But the engine has is, is been modified and improved from its original core but it's been it's been proven capable to handle that heat, and I and I don't know that over the life of the machine that the, the engine is going to be the first part to fail. If you know what I mean, that I think other components past fifteen thousand hours are going to start to cost much more significant than than the core engine, and that's where all of your cost, that's where all your fluid is going. I mean, you're not going to, you're still going to be concerned about your front axle and your transmission, but your engine is the heart of your machine. That's what's costing money to run. That's the diesel user and that's the deaf user. So, uh, yeah, I mean, feel free to uh, invite those guys over. I'd be happy to show them the slideshow, I guess. But, yeah. That's just some comments. The discussion comments. I think I think it's it varies, you know, based on uh, based on the quantity that you're going to buy it in, and, and based on where you're getting it. I know truck stops have it. it obviously, the semis are using it now, but you know we'll have to get a, a hold of the parts guys at the parts counter and find out exact pricing on that. I know they got some two and a half gallon trucks in here last week, so we can go in and, and ask them exactly on the price. I know we were told a little cheaper than diesel. Yeah. I think, it, I think it's going to fluctuate probably a, a little bit there, but... Plus Walmart's, uh, Walmart, What's that? Walmart's got depth now. Walmart has yeah, depth. It's, it's right. everywhere. There you go. There you go. So here's an interesting little deal. This is a Ipeco motor. So if, if you guys are familiar with their competition, the biggest one would be Case A H in New Holland. Um, they're owned by... Fiat Motors, and Fiat Motors owns Iveco Motors, and Iveco Motors are put in the case with on machinery. So, not really a jab at them or anything, this is just the facts. This is uh, IT, 
or, uh, yeah, IT3 to IT4. So this is their engine at IT4. So they've got the DEF, they've got the SCR, and, and really nothing else on there. This is a direct quote from their website. I'll let you guys read it. A little bit of background for this. Iveco Motors has 400 original equipment manufacturers. So what they're essentially saying is they wanted to make sure that their 400 OEMs are still going to choose their motors because of a simple platform and that this is easy to install into their machine. It doesn't really say much about the end user. It doesn't really say much about the engine's performance and efficiencies. It really is concerned about is Iveco Motors still going to be selling all these engines if they drastically change the engine platform and add in an EGR and a dock and a DPF filter. That to me kind of sums up their their business uh, profile. So again, back to the green equipment. We, we are offering a total package solution for you. So if you're running uh, a couple of machines, uh, big four-wheel drives and, and large combines, you're, you're going to want larger amounts of depth. You know, somewhere in the middle of the road, there's 55-gallon drums. I think there's even a 275-gallon tote in between here. And then if you're just wanting to buy it as you're using it, there's two and a half gallon jugs. There's also going to be uh, some pickup truck mounted toolbox size containers with a def tank and an electric pump, hoses, nozzles, and everything with a lid that you can, you can back that right up here to the back of the store and fill it and take it right out to the field. So there's, there's going to be that complete package from here that Unfortunately, with uh, IT4, the, the competitors down the road did not offer their customers uh, the deaf solutions for their machines that required. So, it's not, not, nope, it can freeze, no problem. It'll no, freeze I mean, on the track, it'll freeze in the, in the shop, and it does not affect it. That's it. You need to fill your tractor. Oh, tote or whatever outside. You need to fill your tractor. This stuff. Right. You're saying if this large tote is sitting outside. Yeah. In that situation, you know, I would probably uh, look at look at either trying to find a heater to to put in that or or to put around it or maybe maybe get something smaller and store it inside. I don't know how much how much of an issue that's going to be, but the urea itself won't won't be affected by the freeze and thaw process. Getting it out of the tank, I understand, could be an issue. Let's take a lighter. Yeah. <laughs> Low torch. What happens if you okay, you run the track, you run the thing out? If your tank's empty and, and you run a free cattle or something that's January, February, then you know I think the, the best the best thing to do would just be to try and get the smallest uh, amount that you can warmed up and, and get that in the tank. Like I said, the tractor's gonna run with the tank frozen. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, once it gets warm, if there's a, a timer on that where it starts to say, hey, uh, the tank is empty or the tank's still frozen, but but if the tank is frozen when you start and there's a frozen depth in there, it will warm up with the industry. If the tank is empty, you run for a while because the tractor may think it's frozen, but you're really not going to be able to trick it, per se, very far. It, what it'll do is it'll just derate your engine RPMs and allow you to get back to uh, the shop and get back to the store or something. Like that. As a result of that, would it just be obviously not turning the complete combustion in? Would that be the result? 
Yeah, I think it's just going to cut down the efficiency. The, the efficiency. It's going to cut down your, your RPMs and your horsepower, so there's less diesel exhaust, there's less NOx, there's less PM to be treated, and that's why the the EPA is okay with that system of, of you know saying well, we're not going to have a tank heater on this tractor running 24 hours a day, so it's gonna it's gonna freeze at night. Six o'clock in the morning, it's going to be frozen. It's going to warm up at some point, five, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes. Okay, is there is there a fuel gauge on this BSFT? Uh, yes, there is, and boy, I did not get any information on where that is on the screen. You got me on that. I didn't. Uh, I didn't get a picture of the. You got me. You got me there. I didn't get a picture of the fuel gauge for the death tank, but yes, that is uh, that is on. So if you're completely out of it, your tractor will still run fine. No, it won't run fine. It will derate the engine RPMs, so you won't have you won't have the ability to pull a vertical tillage to another 40 acres. You're just going to have enough RPM and enough engine horsepower left to get you and that piece of equipment back to the shop or back to the end rows or safely off the highway so that you can add more depth to it. We ended up with a 72 60 this spring tree not planned on. But anyway, I was not told uses depth. On a 72 60? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. 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 Can't believe that. You're you're saying your tractor doesn't have well, the I'm, I'm asking you No, now. no, it does not. I did not think so. That's no, thought, this is for this is for the new product coming out with 2014. So this okay. going back to the okay. the final tier four. This is all new equipment. Uh, so, so in so in October. The end of October of this year in Waterloo, they will start to produce these tractors. Yes. Yep. But we are getting the DEF into our facilities now, obviously in preparation for that, but also because uh, we're not going to allow machinery to be delivered here without a, a source for you to take care of. So. There was a comment about Walmart. Is all DEF the as far as needs that are are uh, important to deer, the deer is going to have. As far as I know, the the biggest thing in your fuel system is the ultra low sulfur diesel. I do not know that there are differences in the diesel exhaust fluid unique to John Deere that you would find adversely affect the machine from buying at a Walmart or the Flying J or wherever else. That's Somebody will probably do that someday yeah, just to market it, but not right, right now. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I think I went a little bit over, but Wade is going to talk next on vertical tillage. I'll pull this thing up. Okay. I don't know how I could be more exciting than Final Tier 4, but I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, my name is Wade Daggett. I'm a field marketer out of our Missouri Valley location. Um, I had a partner on this project, but... You know, the dog didn't need his homework. He's off having a child here soon, so he couldn't be away from home. So, I keep mama happy. <laughs> okay, why did Deer come up with a vertical tillage tool? What were you looking for as a grower? What everybody's looking for, more yield. Some of the things it's designed to do and why they produce this. Size and chop the residue. Level the soil profile, smooth the soil profile, mix the soil, 
aerate the soil, anchor the residue, remove ruts, firm the seed bed, manage weeds, shatter root balls, working at faster speeds. We're going to talk about this. This is a high speed tillage tool. Incorporate chemicals and to use in the fall and the spring conditions. I've had the pleasure of demoing a vertical tillage tool probably 20 times now. Um, I've run in the fall, run in the spring. I've run on chopped stocks. I've run on stocks that weren't chopped prior to running. You didn't know which field was which. There's, you're absolutely wasting your time to chop stocks before you run on it because of the uh, little size it perfectly. Okay, some of the features on it. We have an active hydraulic rolling basket, and I'll touch on this more, but our hydraulic basket has hydraulic down pressure instead of a spring. It's a lot easier to control and keep, keep it on the ground easier. Um, operating speeds are up to seven to 10 miles an hour. You can get a lot, of, a lot of ground covered with these, but later on, I'll go over this. We, do, we don't want you to, they say eight to 12 horsepower per foot. We want you on the upper end of that. You're not gonna be happy on the lower end. Um, so I'll show you the horsepower suggestions later. Seven and a half inch spacing on the blades. 22 inch spherical blades on the front, 22 inch wavy blades on the rear. Some of the things that people were looking for. Strength and reliability, it has a two inch gang bolt, built very heavy. Uh, increased productivity, that's our fast speeds that we can pull this across the field. Easy maintenance, we have gang bearings, basket, rock shaft that are maintenance free. Chop and size. The residue, uh, the unique blade configurations take care of this. Uniform seed bed, the aggressive gang angle, we'll get into that in a minute also. Level and smooth, the soil profile. The hydraulic rolling basket, if you haven't been around one, you've never seen anything smoother when you're done going through the field than after this runs in the right conditions. I'll talk about the wrong ones in a little bit. Hydraulic fore and aft leveling also, so you can, it's standard from one of your SCVs, you can level the, level the tool, um, and I'll talk about how you know you're running right here in a little bit too. Kind of hard to see here, it's getting a little brighter out, but the aggressive gang angle, uh, the blades are running more at an angle. Uh, some vertical tillage, they're going to run straight across, and I'll show you a little bit why deer went with the aggressive angle. Blade configurations, this is just showing straight blades on the front, spherical blades, and then it doesn't show but the wavy on the rear, and this is what the hydraulic basket looks like. Some of the photos of what it appears looks a lot like a disc, if you don't know what you're looking at. Are they gang mounted like this? Yes. Yeah. Yep. They couldn't tell that. Yep. Uh, 22 inch blades in the front, they're designed to chop and size 60 to 70 percent of the chopping is done in the front. Manage the weeds, root balls, and the blades are designed to stay sharp that way. We have the wavy in the rear, uh, mix the soil, aerate the soil, anchor the residue. So that's designed to move the soil more than the front. It's kind of, if you can see what it's going to look like going through. Here's why deer went with the aggressive gang angle versus the straight vertical. In the vertical, you're going to find a lot of peaks and valleys. The gang has a little more level soil profile when you're finished. This is another photo from straight back to loose topsoil. You're going to see more peaks and valleys than on the aggressive gang angle. Again, kind of hard to see, but roots on our plant here that are not sitting in peaks and valleys have the ability to go deeper, wider. If you run into peaks and valleys, you're going to have 
have a little bit more of a spread out, not near as deep root system for stand. Okay. Additional benefits of the aggressive dank uh, angle, anchor the residue, manage the weeds. We've kind of went over some of this. I have a lot of guys in my area running no-till and hills and it's getting real ruddy. Uh, they make a pass on this. They really like just smoothing the field out for them. Is it, quote, legal on ATL land? What's that? Is it, quote, legal from the, from the government? Yes, it, it's, it is. Well, in Bear County, they, 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 they tried to eliminate the, the sulfur type of machine, which I have not. Yeah. I got by, so it never had a check, but I would guess I mean, could be out of compliance if I did. Right. No, this should handle that. That's a guy, actually, what you're saying, though, I think this would be, would be more tillage than the straight plate. Yeah, it's it's not burying the residue, no. chopping, sizing, pressing it in place so it stays there. Because if we want, as hard as stocks are these days, to get the breakdown, you need a couple things. Moisture and oxygen, so we can't bury them or they're not going to break down, they're just going to sit there. So this is going to keep them up above the soil, chop them, size them, let the moisture get in, the ground from contact will help them rot down. Okay, the round bar or flat bar option, this is the rolling basket. Um, we order all of ours with the flat bar and not the round bar, and the reason being when the flat bar contacts the ground, it doesn't have as much surface area as the round bar because it's going to kind of roll across. So it's the flat's less apt to, to pick up mud if you run through uh, part of the field that's a little too wet. It has the ability to run in a raised mode. If you absolutely had to run in a wet condition, you can raise them up hydraulically, keep them out of the way. They don't do good in wet soil. and. You know, we don't want you in there when it's wet, but last spring, you know, sometimes you just got to go. Float mode, if your soil is really fluffy and light, you can run in float, just kind of let them, you know, no, no hydraulic pressure on them. Applying the down pressure, how we do this is we run on a constant flow and we turn down to just a trickle. You know, between one and ten, I probably ran on about a one, one and a half as far as flow rate goes, and on constant flow. Had a couple people that uh, got out, didn't get their uh, tool set up right, ran way too high a pressure back there. It's going to make a mess, blow a hose. Uh, you don't want to do that. So if you do purchase one or have one and want, your field marketer should be able to come out and help you set it. Another thing in setting, um, we talked about just a little bit ago was the leveling of the machine. It's not hard to level again. If, if, the, the, if you're piling on the front edges, you're in too deep with your nose. If you're piling in the middle, you're in too deep with your rear. Um, all of them have A, B, C, D adjustments, uh, and you can read it clearly. Every one I've ever run on, every type of soil condition, the C setting has been about perfect. When you go to transport it, I bring the nose back down, run it on A because it's going to slap around a bunch if all that weight's sitting level on the machine while you're transporting, so I'll bring it back down. Here's what I really wanted to get into, the horsepower. This is really, really critical. Um, about the only complaints we've ever heard about this tool is somebody didn't have enough horse to move this thing through the field. And speed takes so many more horses. If you're pulling this at five miles an hour versus seven or ten, you don't need near as many horse. But um, we have some 20 foot nine inches. These are the sizes: 20 foot five, 29 three, 30 foot eight, 33 seven, 40 foot eight. Horsepower requirements are here in PTO, not engine horse. And you can see we want you to run on the top end. Uh, probably two of the more popular sizes we sell, the 26.5 and the 30 foot 8. Those, are, those have been the most popular in our neck of the woods. Um, and then another thing to really that deer can tout on on this, this is heavy, heavy, heavily built. It is not coming out of the ground. 
There's the lightest one is 197 pounds per blade. Our vertical tillage competition, most of it's about 150, 160 pounds per blade. We're way heavier. Transport heights are low, 15-2, and we won't sell a whole bunch of 33 footers, but you can see that transport's narrow and low to make it easy to get down the road. Some of the highlights, the hydraulic four and a half leveling, maintenance free bearings, the gang angle, the heaviness of it, strength and reliability, and also the two inch gang bolt. Now, we'll have people that, that go in and, and run this in the fall, plant right into it. We'll have other people that run it in the fall and again in the spring. Won't surprise me. So we'll see it run spring, fall. Uh, I'll open it up. Any questions you guys may have? If not, I'd suggest if you have any interest at all, we have demo models that your field marketer or salesperson, if you're not used to that term, uh, should be able to bring out and run a demo for you. But I promise you, you will love what comes out behind it. Smooth, consistent, and a very nice seat bed. So thank you guys for coming. I'm supposed to relay on that there are you can go out and ride and drive. We have a 6R, 7R, and a 9R tractor. So down at the far end, if you have anything that you want to get in, we'll have somebody there to show you how to run it if you haven't run one. Um, but thanks for your time. Your business is very important to us, and we appreciate it. Have a safe trip home. Now, vertical pillage just came out in 2001. That's the first part of deer producing. You may have heard of a turbo till in the past. That's something that's pretty popular. That's Case's model. Um, the turbo till leads a lot of the first People that have run them both.